I think Charlie said it was in the 80s sometime when he started to rent to artists and he noticed that artists were pulling mattresses in there and sleeping. It was only scheduled as a commercial building, so you couldn't have people live in there. So artists were living here illegally initially. Charlie figured, well, if this makes a lot of sense, so he started to lobby and actually got the, got the zoning change to make it uh, commercial residential. My name is Frank Antosca, and I've lived in the copycat. Um, this April will be nine years. Oh, la bozza In 98, um, I had known Charlie from shooting pool around here in a couple of the local pool, pool places. And um, we got to talk, and he told me about the building, and I came over and actually rented an apartment uh, on F300 side. 2007... Charlie gave me a call and said that he had a job for me, and I came here, had a place to live, had a place to work, all in one slam dunk. So uh, it was supposed to be a, a small part-time job that he continued to tell me was never going to be more than a few hours a week, and we see what happened. My title is office supervisor, uh, and I do control the office. Um, but in essence, I'm the only face that anybody sees in the copycat. So people think I'm anything from the owner to the building manager to the uh, part owner. We have a little bit of anything you can think of lives in the copycat. And it forms this oddly cohesive community that uh, probably wouldn't work anywhere else. We have starving artists. We have successful artists, we have world famous artists, we have MDs, and we have micro students. We have a lot of uh, urban tag, taggers and, and street painters that have become artists through the years. Probably some artists that have fallen to street painters through the years. So it's just a very wide cross-section of, of humans. We have people that you would never believe would live here in a million years. Somebody that looks like they belong in a house in suburbia in their 60s. And they live in the copycat. And luckily, there's something for everybody here in most price ranges. <laughs> well, there's always that. My name is James Healy, and I've lived in the copycat for about two years. The main thing I'm doing with my life right now is my uh, repair shop right here. Spending a lot of time here working on this, working on guitars. I'm working on several at the same time right now. I knew I wanted to do uh, something that involved a trade, you know, and use my hands. And, and music has always been a big part of my life. And I decided that I wanted to make a living off of music, but not being a gigging musician. You know, I didn't want to compromise the, the passion I had for the actual music by attempting to play it to earn a living. And uh, that's how I fell into fixing guitars. See, the first, the first time I came to the copycat was to, to look at the, the, the unit that I live in now. I thought, you know, to myself, is, is this real? I thought these kinds of places only existed in movies. You know, I didn't know they were an actual thing that people did live in. We have this, the luxury of living in this, in this city that's, you know, uh, in a lot of ways kind of decrepit and just crumbling down, you know, and it gives uh, places like the copycat uh, the, the chance to exist. 15 to 20 years, I think the copycat is either going to be not there completely and there's going to be condos in its place or a parking lot for the train station. Um, or, you know, it could be exactly the same. But uh, I guess uh, time will tell. The money will tell. The greatest thing about the copycat, it's in a position to stay exactly like it is for a very long time.
because it just doesn't work out dollars and cents wise. There are plenty of people that have the money, but they wouldn't invest in this in a million years. So if in 20 years the neighborhood has come to a place where it can afford three, four thousand dollar a month rents, maybe something will happen then, but not until then. Baltimore is going to have to get a lot more people in it. It's half populated. There was a million people in here when I was a child. Now there's less than half a million. They've all left because the city is poorly managed. It's bankrupt. And um, I think that it's just a very long time in coming. The grunginess doesn't bother me at all. You know, it definitely has its appeal and, and, its, and its charm. Um, I mean, part of me would like to see like these floors, you know, sanded and stained and looking really nice. And then part of me really likes just that they're fucked up. And you can see like years of people walking on the floors. And just think about what the hell they were up to. This is a unique entity and it'll stay that way as long as it stays affordable. People just flock to get in here. It's, uh, I get Micah kids calling me a year in advance. We want one of the big spots in the B side. Blah, 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 blah. You know, they get away with more than they can get away with in any building in the world. They can make an artistic mess as long as they aren't, you know, trying to defile the building. Pretty much we, uh, we allow people to do the kind of art they want to do and it doesn't hurt their security deposit. Baltimore's a quirky place anyway. Baltimoreans are quirky. You know, John Waters says, he says the difference between New York and Baltimore, he goes, New Yorkers um, are crazy and they know it. He says, Baltimoreans are crazy and they think they're the most normal people in the world. And, and he's right. <laughs> so, what else can I say?